I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine, too. And I think it's time that I asked you a riddle again. Yes, I think it's time, too. All right, why is a dog's tail like the center of a tree? Oh, that's hard. Oh, that's wrong. Why is the dog's tail like the center of a tree? Because... No, that isn't it. Oh, oh, because... No, no, that isn't it. Because the... Nope, that isn't it either. Oh, all right, I give up. <laughs> Why is the dog's tail like the center of a tree? Because it's farthest from the bark. Hmm? Oh, how that's yeah. A dog's tail is farthest from his mouth, and that's what he barks with. And the center of the tree is farthest from the bark. That's right. <laughs> oh, that was good. Now will you please read me the funny? Buck the Comic Weekly. Yeah. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the first section, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> Today, we're out at the army camp where Beetle Sergeant has lined a squad of men up on the parade grounds, all ready to put them through marching maneuvers. He roars. I'll teach you men to obey orders if it's the last thing I do. Eyes front! Sergeant marches a few feet ahead of his men, looking back over his shoulder at him. The yard now! Keep going! Last picture top row, the sergeant marches into a telephone pole. Cut, two, three, go! And he slumps to the ground unconscious. The men don't see what's happened and march on straight for the gate leading out of the parade ground. Not hearing any commands to the contrary, out the gate they go. First picture bottom row, they're marching along the highway. Beetle says, Hey, why do you think he's taking us? We're not paid to think. Hey, we're not paid. Period. Second picture bottom row, they march down the main street of a town. Third picture bottom row, they head straight for a truck that has the end gate down. They don't hear any commands to stop, so they march straight up the gate and onto the truck. Beetle exclaims, Hey, we're going right onto a truck. Well, I don't hear him telling us to stop. A truck driver who happens to be a soldier from the camp says, Hey, you guys want a ride? I'm going back to camp. Last picture, the truck roars back into camp. The men see the sergeant lying on the ground by the telephone pole. And one says, Hi, how'd he get back here so quick? And the sergeant opens his eyes and sees the men on the truck, and he goes, Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that funny? The way the sergeant starts the men marching, and then marches into the post and knocks himself subconscious. Yeah. <laughs> then the men keep marching and marching until they end up marching out of the truck. And of course they can't march over the top of the truck, so they just stop there. And then they get a ride back to camp. I'll bet you that made them glad. <laughs> yes, you bet it did. Now what would you like to read? Oh, I'm anxious to read Peter Pan. Very well. Let's go over the page past little iodine, over to page three where you'll find Prince Val. Turn over that page. And here we are on page four with Peter Pan. 
And you remember that Peter had rescued Tiger Lily, the Indian chief's daughter, from Captain Hook. And that saved the life of all the boys, because the chief was going to have the boys burned at sunrise if Tiger Lily wasn't returned to camp, because he thought that the boys had taken Tiger Lily. Yes, so it looks as though the boys' lives will be saved. Let's read now and see if that happens. Here we go with Peter Pan. Say the magic words with me. Pirates, crocodiles, Peter Pie Pan. Whisk up music for Never Never Land. Peter Pan has rescued Tiger Lily and brought her back to the Indian chief. And now a great celebration fills the Indian camp. The boys have been released according to the chief's promise. And Peter Pan stands in front of the Indian chief with a long Indian headdress that reaches from the top of his head to the ground. The chief says, Peter Pan, mighty warrior, be glad to make them little flying eagle. And the boys yell, Last picture top row, from a distance, a forlorn figure watches. It is the pixie, Tinker Bell, whom Peter had banished for a week because of her jealousy over Wendy. Meanwhile, first picture bottom row, back on the pirate ship. Captain Hook is recovering from his watery struggle with the crocodile. Hook has a bad cold, and he's sitting in a chair with a hot water bottle on his head and his feet in a tub of steaming water. His man, Smee, pours in more hot water. As Hook groans, Oh, that cursed Peter Pan! Smee says, Hey, Captain, I hear there's trouble brewing on the island. Woman trouble. Peter Pan has banished Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell? Banished? Aye, Captain. Tink's terrible jealous of Wendy. Tried to do her evil, she did. Fourth picture, bottom row, Hook leaps to his feet. That's it, Smee! That's it! A jealous female can be tricked into revealing Peter Pan's hiding place. And last picture, he exclaims, You will go ashore at once. Pick up Tinkerbell and bring her to me. <laughs> The boys are safe again. The Tiger Lily was returned. Yes, Peter saved everybody's life. Tiger Lily and all the boys. Yes, but what is this plot that Captain Hook's got that he wants to capture Tinkerbell? Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Now look across the page. There's Donald Duck. Oh, Donald Duck, my favorite favorite. And I'll read your favorite favorite right away. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squee jum, squee jum, squee chicka chat. Let's have music to better quack quack. It's early in the morning. Donald is sound asleep. There's a sound at the window. Donald wakes up. Uh, what's that? And then Donald realizes that the sound is coming from the window. Oh, gee, I almost forgot. He gets out of bed and runs to the window. He opens it and sees a burglar standing down below. Oh, yeah. Hey, quiet now. Put up the ladder. Okay, pal. The burglar puts the ladder against the window. And last picture, top row, he climbs up. Hey, quiet now. Quiet, quiet, quiet. And Donald begins to hand the burglar big packages. It's a cinch. I got them all wrapped up. Okay, okay. Third picture, bottom row, Donald is standing beside the truck, which is loaded high with the packages that Donald has given to the burglar. And then the truck drives off. Good luck, pal! Sometime later, at 7 o'clock, the alarm clock goes off. Donald's nephews dash into the room. Hey, Uncle Donald! Uncle Donald! Uncle Donald! A catastrophe! Last picture, Donald sits up, and Louis says... Burglars have swiped our Bebop record collection. Donald smiles and says, How sad. And he thinks to himself, Boy, oh boy, am I glad. Oh, that wasn't nice of Donald at all. He hired the burglar to come and steal the boy's collection of records. Why? Well, you know, sometimes children play only one kind of record, and it's the Bebop kind. And it can drive their parents crazy. But that's no reason to give the records away. Well, then it's up to the children not to play the records so loud and not to play them so often. 
Well, I guess that's only fair. Yes, you bet it is. Now let's turn over the page and go to Flash Gordon. Yes, because Flash is on the moon where he'd been having terrible trouble with Dr. Stella. That was the leader of the crooked band of outlaws. Yes, and after many dangerous adventures, Flash has finally captured Dr. Stella and the outlaws. Yes, but Mark has gone off in Flash's rocket ship, and he's trying to capture a ship that's coming from Earth that's loaded with expensive goods. Yes. I wonder what'll happen when Mark returns. Well, let's read now and find out. That's important because Mark is an outlaw. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash sees that Dr. Stella is going to be all right, so he locks her in the airlock. Then, searching the moon station thoroughly, Flash and Zarkov find that Mark has taken most of the pirate crew on his rocket trip to hijack the passing Sky Freighter. Flash says, Now look, before we do anything else, we'll replace this smashed viewport. I want the place airtight before the outlaws return. Last picture top row. As the air pressure builds up to normal again, Flash discards his space suit and hurries to the instrument room. He takes a quick look in the viewport, and he sees that Mark is returning with the captured cargo carrier. Swiftly, Flash and Zarkov prepare to ambush the returning raiders. They take their post in a gun emplacement. Flash tells Zarkov, we'll strike when they're most vulnerable. At the moment, they pile out of the rocket. However, unknown to Flash, one of the crew at the moon station has revived enough to send a frantic message to the pirate's rocket. And Mark is stunned as the words come through his earphones. Gordon has taken over the base. Stella is a prisoner. You are flying into a trap. <laughs> Inside of the rocket ship, Mark shouts to the pirates. Change course. We'll land at the underground hangar. And a few minutes later, the pirates' rocket and the captured cargo craft approach the protected hideout. Huge doors swing open automatically. And the rocket ships glide in and land underground. Then the doors silently close behind them, completely hiding the ships. Mark has evolved a plan to deal with Flash. He says through tight lips, Gordon's waiting to ambush us. Well, we'll see who gets ambushed. Isn't that terrible? Just when I thought Flash was going to capture everybody, one of the outlaws has to warn Mark. Yes, and now Mark and his ship are safe. And what's more, Mark's got a plan now where he thinks he can beat Flash. I wonder whether we can. Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Now let's turn over to the last page of the first section. Oh, and, and, and here's Dick's adventure. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Dick's Adventures. Magic words for the music, please. Say them with me, please. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick is in the early days of America when Texas belonged to Mexico and when the powerful Mexican general Santa Ana was ruling the territory with a cruel hand. The Americans were trying to secure their liberty. One of the leaders was Jim Bowie who had become a good friend of Dick's. Last week, you remember, Mexican soldiers had trapped Dick and Bowie in the old city hall, but they'd succeeded in making their escape. And now today, Dick and Bowie race down the street with the soldiers after them. Last picture top row, seeing the soldiers behind them, Bowie leaps over a wall into a mission patio. Dick follows in a second, and Bowie sees an old well ahead of him. He stops beside it. Here, wait, Dick, wait. This is our best chance. Grab the rope and slide down. Dick grabs the rope to which a bucket is suspended, and down he goes. A second later, Bowie slides down the rope. First picture bottom row, Bowie points to the bucket that's floating on the surface. That bucket is your new hat, Dick. Get under it fast. Mine will be down in a second. Bowie cuts the rope, and the other bucket, which is now hanging by the pulley at the top of the well, comes plunging down. Quickly, Bowie and Dick pull the buckets over their heads and then stand quietly in the water. A second later, the soldiers who have been following them come to the well. 
They look down and see the two buckets floating on the water below. The captain mutters, Now it is in abandoned well. See, there are the two buckets floating at the bottom. Let us search for those rascals elsewhere. Wasn't that a clever trick to slide down the rope and hide in the water? Yes, and by putting the buckets over their heads, they couldn't be seen by anybody. That Bowie's a very smart man. Yes, he was. But how are they going to get out of the well now? After all, Bowie's cut the rope. Well, that's a trick we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and you remember? Rusty Riley's on Denver Dooley's farm. Mr. Dooley had given Rusty a job there to take care of the horses. Yes, and Rusty arrived at the farm expecting to find a nice old lady. But instead, he found a woman who was rather young who was pretending to be Mrs. Dooley and a man named Mel who says he's the hired man. And there are two people there who are up to something crooked, I know. Yes, those two people are crooked. When Rusty came out to the barn to find the horses, he found there was no oats, and that the horses hadn't been fed for a long time. And that's a very cruel thing to do, to tie animals up and not give them any feed, because after all, they can't help themselves. No, they can't. I wonder who those two people are who treat animals that way. And I wonder what's happening to the real Miss Stewart. Well, let's read now and see if we can get any idea of that. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Mel, the man who is pretending to be the hired man, is in the house talking to the girl named Trixie. I told you those horses would have to have oats. They look like they're ready for the glue factory. Suppose that kid tells Dooley. The girl starts writing a check saying, All right, send him down to the feed store with his check and tell him to bring back the change. We don't want him writing to Dooley yet. In two weeks, we'll have the old gal clean as a plucked goose. Then he can squawk his head off. <laughs> A few minutes later, Mel comes out to the barn. He finds Rusty taking the horses out to water them. Mel says, Oh, uh, here, Rusty. Miss Dooley says to take this check to the feed store in Honey Hollow. Uh, get a bag of oats and bring her the change. Uh, take the station wagon. You can drive, can't you? Oh, sure, sure, Mel. I can drive. Okay. And he goes on last picture top row. Uh, I I'm going to put both of these horses out in the field where they can get some sun. H how do I get to the feed store? Oh, it's right by the bridge, Rusty. And the grocer's name is Jim Woods. Hurry right back now. Short time later, Rusty enters Jim Woods' store, walks up to the counter. Oh, I, I want a bag of oats and a couple of bales of hay. It's for Miss Dooley, and she says to take it out of this check. Well, you're new out there, ain't you? The old lady's still too sick to come into town, is she? Well, why does everybody call Miss Dooley an old lady? She isn't old at all, and she isn't sick. Yeah, now look here, son. I know the Dooleys ever since Denver bought that farm, and I know that Sally Dooley won't ever see 70 again. Short time later, Rusty is back at the farm. He gets out of the car and comes up to Mel. Oh, here's a change from the check, Mel. Mr. Woods seems to think that Miss Dooley is sick. And he says she's real old, over 70. Mel answers, Oh, the old goat's got her mixed up with somebody else, Rusty. Forget it. And uh, unload that feed. At last picture, Mel is in the house again, talking to Trixie. Now listen, Trixie, I think the kid's getting too curious. Those yokels in town have been asking about the old lady. And you don't look like no grandma. Trixie takes off her glasses and says, I was afraid of that. Well, Mel, the time has come to take care of the old lady and clear out. Oh, I'm glad that Rusty got that feed. Now the horses will be fed and taken care of kindly. Yes, they will. And now Rusty learns something from the man in the store that might make him suspicious enough to talk to the police. Yes, you never know. I hope it works because that girl, Trixie, said they'd have to take care of the old lady. And that might mean they'll be doing something terrible to her. Well, maybe we'll find out about that next week. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section of Puck the County Geek. Yes, and here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ram a food, am a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> 
Ray Dagwood is laying down the law to Blondie. We simply have to cut down household expenses. How? Well, for instance, this article tells how to cook a wonderful dinner for four people for only one dollar. Okay, we'll try it. Last picture, top row. Dagwood is at the grocery store ordering groceries. Well, let's see. Two carrots, one tomato, noodles, hamburger. First picture, second row. Dagwood comes into the house again with his arm full of groceries. It came to one dollar even. Just think of it. One dollar for a family feast. I'll start cooking it right away. Dagwood puts the groceries down and helps Blondie under the coat. Oh, no, you don't. You go to Mrs. Woodley's. I'll cook it myself, and I'll call you when it's ready. Last picture, second row. Dagwood's busy cooking the dinner. We'll be able to cut our expenses 50%. A high cost of living won't bother us anymore. <laughs> Half hour later, first picture, third row, Dagwood has his meal well along. He dips his spoon in the kettle and tastes his famous preparation. Ah, it's coming along fine. Well, now I'll just take a nap for 20 minutes while it cooks. A few minutes later, Dagwood is on the sofa taking his nap, and he dreams that he's chopping down a tree. A tree that's called... The high cost of living. Last picture, third row, Tootsie Woodley looks out of the window of her house. And then she turns to Blondie, who is visiting her, and exclaims, Blondie, look at the smoke pouring from your kitchen. Okay, man, right in here. Right in here. Bring in that hole. Bring in those axes. First picture, bottom row, Blondie in the fire department dash through the living room of the Bumstead house. Dagwood wakes up and exclaims, Hey, what's all the excitement? They all dash out into the kitchen, and then they all stop. For there they see the cloud of smoke is coming from the top of the stove, and the fire chief says, Hey, what's that? It's the dollar dinner burnt black. <laughs> Last picture, the whole family is in a restaurant downtown, and Blondie is saying to the waiter, I'll have a tenderloin steak. And Cookie says, Yes, I'll have steak, too. And Alexander says, Yeah, I'll have chicken. And as Dagwood thinks of all the money this dinner is going to cost him, he grinds his teeth in anger. <laughs> Dagwood, wasn't that too bad? Yes, it was. That was a mighty expensive nap that he took. Yes, that was a mighty expensive nap that he took. Next time, you better let Blondie try to prepare that dollar dinner if he expects to save any money. Yes. Well, now I'm sure that you want to read Roy Rogers. Oh, you know I do. Very well. Turn over the page. Go past the Lone Ranger. Turn over page three. And here we are on page four with Roy Rogers. And you remember, Roy was on his way to see Scarecrow Katie. That's that nice old man who likes birds. Yes, he was going to tell Katie that he's in danger. And you remember last week, those cattlemen, they're trying to drive the farmers out of the country, and they had caused a lot of damage to the home of the Trents. Those are the leaders of the farmers. Yes, and one of the cattlemen was dressed like Scarecrow Katie. And the Trents think that Katie is the leader of the cattlemen. And as Roy was coming right near to Katie's place, he sent a trained falcon after Roy. Yes, and the bird flew straight at Roy and started to dive for his eyes. I wonder if he'll hurt Roy. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers. yip by oh Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. yip by oh <laughs> Roy and Katie's daughter, Oriel, approach Katie's hiding place. But the bird that Katie had sent for Roy dives straight for him. Now get away there, will you? Hey, beat it. Hey, hop, Trigger. Thinking quickly, Roy heads for the river nearby. Trigger leaps in the water. And Roy dives underneath where the bird can't reach him. When Roy emerges, he sees old man Katie running toward them. The old man calls to the falcon. Here, here, stop it, black lady. Come here, come here. Hey, that's my friend. Hey, gosh, Roy, I'm sorry. Roy comes out of the water, 
and says to Katie, Well, say, if this is the way you welcome friends, I'd hate to be an enemy, Katie. Phew. Last picture, top row, the three of them head for Katie's shack. Oriel tells her father that the farmers think that he has led the raid on the Trent farm and killed all of Trent's animals. Why, they're loco, Oriel. I've been here with my birds all the time. They come on inside and get dry, Rogers. First picture, bottom row, they go inside the cabin. Say, now look, Katie, you're being used as a scapegoat. Ranchers must masquerade as you in these attacks on the homesteaders. Yeah, but the ranchers are my friends, Roy. Snapper Sloan even found this place for me to hide out. A short time later, Snapper Sloan, one of the ranchers who had led the raid on the Trent farm, dressed in Scarecrow Katie's clothes, is on the trail, heading for Katie's hideout. Hurry up, Pete. We gotta make sure Scarecrow Katie ain't caught by that posse of nesters. They know he's hiding somewhere in these woods. Yeah, if they string him up, you got nobody to blame the raids on. A few minutes later, Roy comes out of Katie's shack. He is saying to Katie, You know, Katie, the fact that Sloan, your rancher pal, wants you to stay undercover looks mighty suspicious to me. I reckon I'll have a little talk with him. At that moment, Snapper Sloan has dismounted and is just coming around the corner of the cabin. He hears what Roy says. He steps out. Last picture holding a gun on Roy says, All right, start spieling, cowboy. And it better be good. Katie exclaims, Snapper Sloan. Oh, I'm certainly glad the scarecrow Katie called off that bird before Roy came up from under the water. Yes, that saved Roy from being scratched up. Yes, but now what's going to happen? Now that Snapper Sloan heard what Roy said. That looks mighty dangerous because what Roy has just said has forced Snapper Sloan to come out in the open. And it looks like a showdown between Sloan and his cattlemen and Roy and old man Katie. I wonder what'll happen. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Connie Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.